Good afternoon. Well, uh, it's a big pleasure being here. Thank you very much for your interest to come here to listen to us. Um, and so it, I think it's, we've been here for the second time. I was accompanying actually one of our leaders a while back when he came here and spoke. But well, I'm, I'm very grateful for your interest. It's, a, it's an honor, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, as you know, uh, Afghanistan, there's so many things going on, so, but I'll keep my discussions a little bit focused on the issue of peace and reconciliation uh, for two reasons. First, it's an important and a vital issue for us. And then I, I really would like to benefit from your input too, but also give you some, some hint on what we have learned, how peace talks are conducted. And, and so, um, Issues that I will cover, actually, uh, the issue of pluralism and parliamentary and presidential election, that's an important issue for us right now. So I'll, I'll briefly cover that, but if needed, we can actually talk more in detail about uh, the, the prospects of the presidential election and how the parliamentary election went in Afghanistan. On the peace talk, answering some basic questions that Afghans and our friends have, like, why should we talk to Taliban? And, and, and where should we talk to them with? Is it, should it be Kabul, should it be Islamabad, should it be Doha, should it be Moscow? Uh, and uh, what are we talking about so far? It's been six or seven rounds of talk, or, or, it's, or it's been a series of contacts since 2004. Uh, is there a national consensus in Afghanistan about peace? Do, do Afghans really want peace? And, uh, and what has been accomplished so far? And what is the roadmap for the future? And also the role of the international community, our friends in the US, e EU, UK, and other, and uh, uh, what kind of political participation we would like to see by Taliban in the government if the peace process is successful. So, and what we've learned. So I, but before actually getting to this discussion about the peace, I just as a prelude, I wanna tell you that you hear a lot about the security situation in Afghanistan about the uh, challenges that we are facing in the security area, but you don't hear that a new Afghanistan is also emerging. And Afghanistan, that free media is a fundamental piece of it, and Afghanistan where we have a parliament, and Afghanistan where a new generation of Afghans who have been educated in the past 18 years without the influence of Taliban are increasingly taking the charge of running the country we have significant number of very young leaders in Afghanistan, especially deputy minister, minister level, men and women both. Uh, for instance, our ambassador to the US, our uh, ambassador to the UN, or young, very capable Afghan uh, ladies that were educated post-Taliban era, and they're leading our diplomatic efforts there. And, uh, and a significant number of children, more, more than nine million children are going to school, one third of them are girls. There's room to improve the quality of education, but the fact that these numbers of the universities exist. When we went back in 2001, there was one university in Afghanistan, mostly about 4,000 students, all boys with, with no exception. Now we have actually close, over, close to 400 uh, institutions of higher education, including 86 universities. Uh, some of the universities or the quality is so good that Afghan refugees are coming from Pakistan, from Iran, other places to enroll in these universities because that caliber or that quality of education is not available in, in neighboring countries. So, um, and again, if there is time, we can talk about that. Afghanistan is more and more actually has a private sector-led economy. The, the income that generated in Afghanistan, the revenue that the government collect is increased significantly. But the main, uh, and, and I'll also cover briefly the issue of pluralism in the elections. We, we did have actually a parliamentary elections in October, in late October of last year. And finally, the parliament was inaugurated last week. Uh, and the it was the first elections entirely and completely actually managed and organized by Afghans with uh, no participation of uh, UN or other uh, organizations. 2,500 candidates ran for 250 seats of parliament and, uh, uh, and the new parliament was, as I mentioned, was inaugurated there. 
And uh, the presidential elections are scheduled for late September, and uh, the government, President Ghani and, and the government is fully committed to make sure that this election takes place on time. It's not gonna be an easy election. There are security challenges. It's not gonna be the most, to be honest, the most transparent, the most democratic election, but it will be and it must be an election acceptable to the Afghans. So the result should be respected and accepted by the Afghans. So we will do our utmost by using technology and other means to make sure that some of the challenges that existed in the past will not repeat. The uh, Independent Election Commission uh, has been uh, changed and the commissioners uh, are include a uh, significant number of, of educated young Afghan and women. Close to 9 million Afghans have registered to vote, of which 34% are women. Again, all uh, significant, and there's always talk and those who follow the, the, the Afghan issues more closely that we should choose between the peace process and the election and maybe we should delay the election uh, to have some progress in the peace process. I think these are the two important national processes in Afghanistan, the election and the peace process. And we should be able to, to walk and chew gum at the same time. We should be able to work on both of them. It's, it's two important uh, national processes. But now, uh, more uh, focused discussion on the peace talk. <coughs> Why should we talk to Taliban? Again, every, every week, every other week, there's another bombing, there's another security incident, young Afghans are being killed, Taliban are putting bombing in universities and a mosque and other places, killing our security forces. So why should we talk? We should talk because we have to end the bloodshed. We cannot wait for the, for the violence to decrease in order to talk. We have, we have to enter into a peace process because so many Afghans are getting killed on both sides. Even those who are, are being killed on the side of the Taliban, end of the day, they are an Afghan. They might be, they might be misled, they might be uh, indoctrinated, uh, it might be subject to some uh, ideologies outside Afghanistan, but they are Afghans. The bloodshed should start. And is there still made in Afghanistan? The government is not making much progress to wipe out Taliban and the Taliban are still there. Yes, but, but the stalemate does not work in our favor. Because generally, when you are in a counterinsurgency situation, the government will lose by not winning. The insurgency will win by not losing. As long as they are there, they're placing a bomb, they're doing something, then they're there. So, if there is a stalemate, it will not favor us. Therefore, a need to enter into a negotiated settlement. And another issue that you hear about Taliban controlling 50% of Afghanistan, 5% of Afghanistan, 90% of Afghanistan. You, it's depending on which sources you look at it, you hear different, different statistics. Here we should ask ourselves what control means. If control means the ability to destroy and distract, disrupt, then Taliban are controlling 90% of Afghanistan. They can put a bomb almost everywhere they want to. They can uh, uh, train a suicide bomber anywhere they want to. But if control means winning the heart and mind of people, if control means delivering services, educational, health care and other, then they don't control even 2% of Afghanistan because they're not delivering any of these services to anyone, anywhere. Uh, and that's the difference. Again, when you are a government, you are in disadvantage. Control for the government means the ability to deliver services. Control for, for, for the insurgency means the ability to destroy services. And it, it, it could take us two years to build a school. It takes half an hour for Taliban to throw a hand grenade into the school. So control has different meaning for different part of this. Of this. <coughs> you hear a lot in the media, you read it, when you enter into a peace uh, negotiation, you have to have a peace plan. I don't think so. Again, a lot of things that you, and I'm glad that I'm speaking here, and you are all trained actually to, to confront and, 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 and say no to what is usually a textbook uh, uh, version of things. Because if you come up with a comprehensive peace plan 
without going to the other side and start talking to them, you lose your own constituency. Peace process, peace plan is about making compromises. If I have a peace plan that says, well, I appoint Taliban as minister, as governors, and, and well, if Taliban insists, probably I, I look the other way if they don't allow women to go to school. All the southern Afghan women, Afghan minorities, I'll say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You can't do this, we are here. So if you cannot have a comprehensive peace plan until you enter into a peace negotiation. You have to have a peace concept. And once you enter into a peace concept, then you develop. It's like getting married. You cannot start buying a dress and, 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 and planning the party and, and a guest list and, 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 and desserts and, and food while you have not proposed to the other side or the other side have not said yes. So you, you, this, is, this is how it works. Is you, can, you can go ahead of yourself. So, <clears throat> uh, but a real peace plan, anywhere. I served in Colombia as ambassador, so I traveled there a lot with President Uribe and, and Santos and others. So a real peace plan is always a covered peace plan. A, a public peace plan is a PR document. It's a public relation. Oh, we are committed to the peace. This is our plan. A real peace plan is not going to work in a big conference room through Twitter accounts. It's done through a small group of intelligence officers probably quietly sitting somewhere for months and then reaching an agreement. Uh, um, so we have to be mindful about public positioning and private positioning of, in the peace process. Are we negotiating from a position of strength? Something that you also hear and read in the media, you should enter into peace talk from the position of a strength. Again, I don't think so. If, if I'm in the position of a strength, I wipe out the Taliban. There's no need for me to go to talk to them. If they are in a position of a strength, they'll take us out. So we enter into the peace talk from the position of mutual weakness. We know that we have to accept them, we have to work out some solution, and they know that, that we are a, a fact, a reality here, and they have to deal with us. So you enter into peace process from a position of mutual weakness with the aim of further weakening the other side. And the other side knows that. That peace process for us means further weakening Taliban, peace process for Taliban means further weakening us. Yeah, but we have to do it in a way that not to lose the trust because if you do too much of, of, of trying to, uh, to undermine and weaken the other side, then the peace talks will break down. There's no trust. You have to keep the trust. You have to do it in a clever way. Uh, Afghans, even the Taliban foot soldier, are, as I mentioned, are tired of the war. We had a, a, a ceasefire uh, during the uh, holidays uh, last year in, in Afghanistan, uh, Eid holidays, and, and Taliban came to the cities. They start taking selfies with our security forces. They start having ice cream, actually, in, in downtown Kabul. But it means that they are also tired of war. They are not buying that argument that, well, there's all people living in big cities like Kabul. They have to be killed or wiped out. So, and so are the other Afghans. Or even there are pictures, actually, of our security forces actually taking a uh, picture. So mutually, we know and we want peace. And another fallacy or myth that you hear that there is no military solution to a conflict. Again, I don't think so. There is. There's always a military solution to any conflict. The best solution to any conflict is a military solution if you can afford it. <laughs> so, uh, World War I, World War II, there was a military solution. Uh, uh, Germany lost, and, and, and then there was, a, there was a, some talk after that, but the solution was military. There's always a solu military solution to a problem if you can afford it. But in, in, this, in this situation, neither us nor the Taliban can afford the military solution. So that's why, that's why keep in, when you read these things, sometimes in the newspaper, it's not true. There, there is always a very good, very lasting uh, solution, a military solution, but if you can afford it. Again, is there a national consensus in Afghanistan? As I already mentioned that, yes. Yes, people are tired of war. It's been, it's been 40 years since Soviet's invasion. Different type of killing takes place. I was talking with uh, one of the Taliban uh, leaders from, from my hometown in southern Afghanistan, in Kandahar. And the guy said, the guy's lost a, a limb and his wife was killed in a drone attack. And as he said, and his grandson is now uh, fighting. I, said, I really worried about my grandson. I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I thought it was the right cause and I didn't care. But now that my grandson is actually fighting, 
uh, with the Taliban against the uh, government, I'm worried that he might get killed. So it, it, is, it is personal now that it, everybody has paid a price for that. And the same thing on our side. And again, many families have lost many children. Uh, so that's uh, the peace uh, Jirga recently was held in Afghanistan. We have this tradition of Grand Council that, that call all Afghans uh, and, and ask them and talk to them. This is going on for years, for, for thousands of years in, in, in Afghan history. That's been a little bit now formalized and the government get more involved to put a structure to it. So about 3,200 delegates came, 30% were women, and they all said, we really want a peace. And, 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 uh, um, and they, they, they put forward a roadmap for how to, how to proceed. But as I mentioned, one thing is the desire for peace, and one thing is that peace means different things for different people. If you are in Afghanistan, an Afghan woman going to American University of Afghanistan and, and enjoy high quality education, or if you are an Afghan girl working for the government as deputy minister or a spokesperson, for you, you want to keep your rights and privileges as an Afghan citizen. You're entitled to that. These are your constitutional right to go to school, to have the privileges. But if you are the mother of a, of a foot soldier somewhere in, in, in southern or eastern Afghanistan that lost two child and, and then one of their children is enlisted in the, serving in our national army or national police force, you have a different expectation from the peace. And we should understand that. That's why we all want peace, but if there's 30 million Afghans, there are 30 million different interpretation of what kind of peace. What will be a just peace? What will be a peace acceptable to the Afghan people? So and what is the agenda for the peace talk? That's a key point, and, and that answers a lot of your questions about the progress of some of the talks that are taking place in Doha, led by, by American and, our, and their capable uh, representative, Ambassador Khalil Zad, who is a good friend of mine, and also some of the challenges and issues that are associated with that. So there's, there's five issues. The first two issues are very important for Americans. And in these two issues are the U.S. withdrawal or U.S. drawdown, depending on, on how you look at it. Um, even on that issue, I, I'm sure there's not full consensus even in the U.S. Of course, President Trump probably would rather have a withdrawal because he, he promised as part of his election campaign that he'll get the boy back home. But if you talk with, with, with the Pentagon or, 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 or other institution of the military, they might have a different view on, on, on the type of U.S. footprint that's necessary in Afghanistan. And um, so either way, what we expect, we want to have a responsible and gradual withdrawal. We don't want a collapse of the situation. And that's something that not only it's, we are demanding it, your, our European ally, or UK and others that we serve, they, they would rather see that. And that is an, an issue that will be sorted out. As I mentioned, the two first issues are relatively easy issues. So maybe U.S. ask that we would like to keep, say, I don't know, 3,000 troops in Afghanistan, and, and Taliban says, no, 300. So there will be a compromise somewhere in the middle. Uh, that's so, and it, there is some progress on, on that aspect, on the talks between the US uh, and Taliban. And then the second issue is the guarantee by Taliban that they will fight ISIS and they will disassociate themselves from other terrorist group. Again, something easy to do. They will denounce terrorism. Taliban will denounce terrorism, issue an elaborate statement. But then if they do, if they continue to support uh, uh, terrorists, they said, wait a minute, these guys are, are freedom fighters, they're not terrorists. So there's a different interpretation of what terrorists mean. So, but as far as issuing a statement of saying, oh, we, have, we don't have anything to do with terrorism, all the, all the organizations, actually, all the governments, organizations, financial sources that support terrorism, they say, oh, the terrorism, no, 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 we have nothing to do with it. These guys are, are freedom fighters. They're, 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 out, they're fighting for their legitimate rights. So, uh, again, not, not to, that difficult to accomplish that. And then the third issue is, the third, fourth, and fifth issues are important for us as Afghans. It, it's our life, it's our future. And, and the third issue is the political perception of Taliban in the government. What will be that nature? Do, are they going to be the government or part of the government in central government and provinces where they have more influence. So that is it's a tough issue to be negotiated and worked out, and that will require some time to, to do this. And ceasefire, also an, an important issue. 
for both sides. But ceasefire is, I understand, again, in order to, to, to succeed in peace talks, and again, based on my experience, it's not what I say, what I want, what, I, what my slogans are. It's, you should put ourselves also in the position of the enemy, of the other side, where they are coming from. Otherwise, the peace talks will not go anywhere. So naturally, Taliban will not agree to cease fire, because if, if once they agree to cease fire and, and tell to their fighters, the jihad is over, fight is over, done, <coughs> their fighters are gone, it's very difficult to, to reorganize them. So they know that. We, and, and the problem uh, for Taliban on, on accepting the ceasefire is that Taliban are just a military machine, uh, 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 a fighting force. They're not an ideological movement like the Maoist in Sri Lanka that says, well, we, when we succeed, we distribute the land to everyone, we do this and that. It's not an ideology behind it, which was the case, say, some Maoist uh, uh, insurgency in many countries or some other organization that had an ideological and an, an intellectual, actually, platform that they were fighting for. They're, they're fighting to get rid of the infidel, and that's it, and the infidels are gone, so, so what's next? <coughs> so uh, that's why they will not agree easily uh, to cease fire because they will you lose influence. And uh, that's why the, cease, it could take, the, the, the peace process could take longer. And the fifth issue is maintaining and strengthening what has been accomplished in Afghanistan. As I mentioned, okay, our democratic gains are important to the Afghan people. Uh, our, our institutions, especially our security forces, we are very proud of them. They are doing a magnificent job actually defending Afghanistan. We would like to keep them. And, and so part of, any part of the peace process should maintain uh, institutions and, 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 and democratic gains <coughs> in the country. And so uh, what's been accomplished? Six rounds of talks between U.S. and Taliban since uh, uh, December of 2018 in Doha. The seventh round is also scheduled to take place soon. Uh, a lot of progress has been made on the two first issues that I, that I, that I indicated uh, there. Uh, is there a pointer here? Yeah. Um, um, and then uh, there's been also talk between influential Afghans and Taliban in Moscow. Still, the Afghan government is not fully involved in this process because when it comes to these three issues, these issues, it is the part that the Afghan government should, should be involved and should be put on the table. Um, and Uzbekistan is actually now offering, and again, our neighbor to the, to the north, offering to, to, to serve as a place for the, as, as a venue. Uh, and the next round of talk will take place um, again, these are some of the pictures from the, from, the, from the ceasefire during the Eid, our, our commando here and taking picture with Taliban. So there is, it shows that, that Afghans are, are ready to, to forget and forgive and start a new page. Uh, people are, are tired of the war and so are the foot soldiers. And, and again, this picture also make the Taliban leader very worried. That's, well, if the peace process start keep taking momentum, then the fighters might say, Already, actually, if, if, you, if, if I'm a Taliban foot soldier and, and, and my commander is asking me to put by my suicide belt and enter into a mosque, uh, kill myself and, 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 and all the people who are, who are praying in the mosque, while my leader is having high tea in Doha, I said, oh, wait a minute, like, I'll wait before I, I put on the, 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 the suicide belt. Let's see what, what's happening in, in, in Doha before I get myself killed. So it, it, is, it, is, it has an impact on Taliban. When we have, that's why ceasefire will, will make them nervous. Uh, so, um, but also the ceasefire showed that the Taliban have a relatively unified command structure and they can deliver if, if there is progress on the peace uh, process. Um, how long will it take? Uh, a, a question that has been asked frequently. It, in Colombia it took seven years and it's still not full peace. We still had actually incidents, even yesterday. So it could be a long process. Sometimes the peace process is long as is the war. We, we started initial contacts in 2004, and now it's getting into a different phase. But, um, but in case of Taliban, I think if, if we enter into a serious phase, it's going to move fast. The reason is that they are not an ideological movement. The reason is that they know that they lose influence, and that's why they have to wrap it up quickly before actually their own uh, uh, foot soldier demobilize and they lose influence. Listen, learn so far, our first, we need strategic patience. It's not gonna happen in the next uh, week, the next week. It's gonna be a long process, and you have to be ready for that. 
Uh, the process, as I mentioned, started basically in 2004. The first contacts that we had, and I was part of the government, I was chief of staff of President Karzai, the first contact started back then. It didn't go uh, very far because we really didn't know what we were asking for, and there was also those who joined the peace process and came over to, to, to us. We didn't give them a lot of protection, a lot of position, and others, so they were not, that, that didn't continue. Uh, something that you, you hear in the news, again, six rounds of talk in Doha, one round of talk in Moscow, one round of talk was scheduled in Islamabad, it was cancelled. <laughs> Beijing is offered, Tashkent is now the new venue. What's going on? Is it too many places, too many players? No, again, part of any peace talks, part of any peace negotiation is what you call the venue shopping. You, every, side has a, sh as a venue that is better to them, preferable to them. We would rather have everything happen in Kabul if we have it our way. Taliban will probably prefer Doha or Islamabad. So it's, it's, it will be a compromise it's somewhere and, 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 and any negotiation, part of the negotiation is what is the shape of the table, who is going to be on the table, where you're going to have the negotiation. All of that is being underway right now and being negotiated. Um, Role of international community and regional partners, we always welcome in the international community, US especially, UK, European. We have actively, very actively seek the support of Pakistan, an important country for peace and stability in Afghanistan. Taliban are based there in Pakistan, is facing the same challenges that we are facing because of extremism and terrorism threat in, in Pakistan. So uh, they are all, all welcome to play a role. Um, but the, but um, but the Afghan government should be the main partner at the table because the fight is between our security forces and Taliban. It's, it's right now, it's our security forces killing them, it's them actually fighting against our security forces. And the security forces of Afghanistan are under the command of the Afghan government. So if, if, if the Afghan government is not there and someone else actually agree or disagree on issues, they're not going to be able to deliver on those, on those points that they're talking about. Um, and we, we would rather have actually ask our partners to avoid their rivalries. We are, we are in a very fluid and a very, very difficult situation right now in the region. Iran relation with US is getting a lot more complicated than it should. Uh, Saudi and Qatar are not in good terms with each other. Saudi and Iran have complication in their relations. Russia getting more and more involved in Afghanistan, mostly because they want to be seen as a player vis-a-vis -vis US. And so, and, and so the, the regional dynamism is also in a, way, in a way that we would like them to play their role to support us, but keep their rivalries actually out of Afghanistan. Um, the future role of the Taliban in the government, we have no pre precondition that they will be included or excluded. But I know, it is my personal opinion, I know that they're not going to compete through participate in a democratic process that to run for the mayors or for the president or any other job. They have to be given some privileges because, as you know, the, the extremist group nowhere in the world, nowhere, especially nowhere in the Islamic world, do well through elections and ballots. So they, they want to have a privilege, uh, not through, through, through democratic processes. Um, and it may lead to new coalitions. It may change some of the existing uh, setup in Afghanistan. But if uh, the peace is our priority, we better be ready for that and, and work toward that. Uh, but one thing that, that Taliban knows, and, and Afghan also agree with that, is the Taliban is not going to be able to govern by themselves. Taliban are not a mystery like ISIS in Syria. That let's run over some, some post and let's take control and then declare uh, Islamic caliphate and then we'll see how it's going to work. We know how, how Islamic Emirates of Taliban work. They were a government in Afghanistan before 9-11. And there's not a lot of appetite to, to see this being repeated internationally, regionally, or among Afghans. They know that too, that they are not going to be able to govern among themselves. And their biggest uh, funding source, Pakistan right now, has so much economic trouble that Pakistan also know that they are not going to be able to fund a Taliban government in Afghanistan, even if they if they win the war the way they want it, to impose Taliban as a government in Afghanistan, this is going to lead to further isolation of Pakistan and Taliban. So this is it, actually, the main points about the peace and reconciliation, and we'll have to answer your questions on that or any other issues related to Afghanistan. Thank you.
Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. So I wanted to start by congratulating you for receiving the Diplomat of the Year Award this year by your peers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, director, uh, the media director of the Afghanistan Embassy said that you received this award because of your efforts in expanding Afghanistan's relations with the UK. Can you tell us a bit more about these efforts and any challenges that you faced in carrying them out? Well, as, 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 as ambassador, uh, my job is to, to represent my country in the best possible way and uh, attract more uh, investment uh, to Afghanistan, enhance the trade relation between Afghanistan and UK, provide better opportunity for Afghans to edu be educated in, in institutions here in the UK, both our military and our, our students are here in a significant number. Um, and. Uh, also protect the interest and serve the Afghan community here in the United Kingdom. We have about 150, 115,000 Afghans living here. A lot of them came late, most of them, the majority of them came post 9-11 in the past 15 years or so. So they are still not fully integrated into society. They used, when the war started in Afghanistan, uh, Soviet invasion and others, Afghans who left Afghanistan didn't come to the UK or came here in small numbers. Usually a lot of them went to Europe, United States, Australia, Canada, and so the, there's the latecomers. And they, they still have that the Afghan community is still getting there and it's getting better integrated, but it's part of my work is to focus on them also. So following on from that, you've served in as ambassador, um, not only to the UK, but also to the US, Me Mexico, Brazil, Colombia and Argentina. Um, can you tell us a bit about the most striking differences that you found in the challenges in adjusting to these different countries? And did you have to respond to these challenges in different ways? That's a very good question. Um, to be honest, when I went uh, as ambassador to US from Kabul, I expected Washington to be different from Kabul, and it was. Uh, and it was, I served for a long time, I, I served for seven years as ambassador, and it was a rewarding time, I really enjoyed my time there and it was a close partnership with the US. But when I came to London as ambassador, I thought, I know London, I served in Washington, it's, it's very similar, and it's not. And really the difference between Washington and London is, is a lot more drastic than the difference between Kabul and Washington. So I, I learned the differences that exist, the way the way UK work and operate. Uh, and uh, I really enjoy my time being here. I, can, and just, I always uh, joke, it says in, in, in Washington, I used to have, uh, tough meetings, but more results. And in London, I always have very good meetings, but less results. Because <laughs> uh, people are, are so so polite here. They don't say no, but uh, sometimes they don't do it either. So <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the other differences that you've sort of found difficult to adjust to from moving from country to country? Um, well, um, UK is... Uh, preoccupied with Brexit uh, and um, uh, generally uh, British uh, diplomats uh, are well respected uh, globally mm, as a way of example for instance Germany provide a lot more financial assistance to Afghanistan than UK but traditionally the UK ambassador in Kabul is a lot more influential than the German ambassador because they bring better degree of soft skills with them and better degree of knowledge. So as, as a diplomat who, who really loves this country and, and loves Afghanistan and the region, it's, it kind of hurts when you see that UK is no longer present at the table in some bigger crises like, like in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Uh, so, at, uh, uh, so the preoccupation of, of UK with Brexit is a challenge that all ambassadors here are facing. Uh, but what is helpful to me, at least, is that then we have also a large number of kind of alumni of Afghanistan, people who served in Afghanistan, in the military or, or otherwise. And they, they do care about Afghanistan, despite serving in some of the challenging, some of the toughest area in Afghanistan, they, they recognized our, our struggle. And so I can count on them. And some of them are in very high ranking position in the government. So they are, being, they are, being, they are helpful. Uh, even if, it's Afghan uh, if Afghanistan is not necessarily their portfolio, especially people in the military and, 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 the, and the cabinet office. And how do you plan to address the preoccupation with Brexit um, in carrying out your work in the future in the UK? We have to take it as a fact. Unfortunately, a lot of 
really capable, uh, creative and energetic minds at the FCO are, are, are observed by, by, by FCO, that's a fact. Uh, um, so we are uh, we are working with uh, with uh, we have um, uh, we are UK fortunately has also a, a capable and a strong embassy in Kabul, mm -hmm. uh, but but I think a lot of if um, you get you have a lot of uh, people t speaking here and if you probably get other ambassadors they will agree that they would rather see actually more focus of UK on issues other than European Union and other than Brexit. Thank you. Um, so moving in a different direction, you've been supportive of the involvement of women in Afghan politics and you've just spoken about the importance of including them in educational institutions. How else have you worked to promote this aim, both in your capacity as Chief of Staff to the President um, and in your work abroad? Well, as, as, as Chief of Staff, especially during the critical years that the, we were building the institutions in Afghanistan, um, you, you have, and a chief of staff is an important, uh, powerful position, especially when we didn't have parliament, we didn't have all the other institutions. So we were able to, to take a lot of decisions kind of on the spot and quickly to make a difference. So I'm, I, we, I'm really proud of what we accomplished in those three years. Could it be done more? Probably yes. You always look back and it says, well, because there is always what they call a, a golden era after, after any intervention or any war ended, so you can do a lot more. When you look back, it says, well, I wish we could do it. But honestly, we did what we thought was right for the country, but we didn't know all of the stuff that was right for the country. We, a lot of us went there or, or without proper uh, training in, in education on state building, on institutional building. We, we were committed, we had our emotions from people like me to our president, many others, but we really don't, didn't know what it takes and how you do this. And, 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 and we were also influenced by, by people coming from abroad with ideas, a lot of it's good, uh, with good intention, but not necessarily uh, the most lasting uh, way of, of bringing about changes to the country. Mm -hmm. So in the work that you did do, um, in, in what ways did you promote involvement of women in Afghanistan politics? Um, what we did is actually we changed a lot of the laws that were on the book. For instance, uh, the Afghan parliament, by, th by the law, has, must have 30% Afghan women in the parliament. Uh, so you, you change a lot of the existing structures and laws to provide for better participation of women. Does it change everything in the society? Not necessarily. Because, because the impediment that, that women are facing in, 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 in countries like Afghanistan, it's not, it's not all law-based, a lot of it's culture-based. And, and you cannot change a culture by a decree, by a new law. You will change the culture by education. And, and so that's the part that we did um, change uh, a lot of laws. We did create institutions. And again, there's a lot of debate. You, you created the Ministry of Women's Affairs and there was a lot of debate, do we need this? Or it's better actually to have a, a well, my argument was we don't need a Ministry of Women's Affairs, we need a Ministry of Men's Affairs because the problems are men. So, and, 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 and we should focus on educating them. Uh, women are doing their job, it's just the men, we men that we are not allowing them to, to do their so It has to be a Ministry of Men Affairs too, instead of Women's Affairs. But, or it should be actually each, uh, each department and in, 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 in each ministry, each department uh, should have a, 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 a directorate or an office in their own institution for Women's Affairs instead of, because once you have a Ministry of Women's Affairs, you kind of check the box and you did your job and then you don't feel like doing anything more. Uh, but these are all the issues and debates that you would have to decide. And, and, and then when you look back and says, did I do the right thing? It's, it's hard to do like the perfectly right thing, to be honest. There's always advantages and disadvantages. There's are kind of different shades of gray. It's not like black and white. You do this, it works. You don't do this, it doesn't work. No, we, we had, this morning we had a discussion uh, with, with another group at a different school about um, is it, what's important, uh, stability or justice? What's important, building state or peace? There's no answer, there's no, you build a state, don't worry about peace, or you, you have a peace accord and build a state, and it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Or, or, or do you actually deliver justice first or for the sake of stability, let, let actually some warlords to be a member of parliament? There's no one clear answer that you choose this one. And, and even if there is one clear answer, you cannot afford it. And again, I'm coming back to the issue that you, you have to implement an, a, a, a solution that you can afford it. Mm -hmm.
So before moving on to questions from the audience, I wanted to ask what's next for you? In which areas do you hope to focus your work over the next few years? Um, and are there any specific goals that you'd like to see realized? Uh, I've been, uh, I've been fortunate uh, uh, to be able to, to do what I consider doing good and well in your life. And I hope all of you get an opportunity. You all, I'm, I'm sure uh, all of you will do actually well in your life being a student in here in the future. But it's also important to do good, do something that has a meaning. The reason I went back to Afghanistan and in the past 18 years work for the government, we get paid far less and, 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 and it's a much difficult job to be in the government, but then you're hoping that you'll make a difference. So um, I think it's important. And fortunately, your generation, comparing to mine, you do care a lot about actually for a job that's meaningful, for something that is impactful. Probably a previous generation was less mindful of that. It was more of a career. I went to a law school, so you become an attorney or and then stay in the law firm for 30 years and retire as a partner and you're happy that you, you made a life and you could retirement. That's not the case uh, with you. So uh, what I, what I uh, suggest and insist is, is, um, is uh, you're fortunate and I was fortunate to stand for principles. To if, if this is right, I'm gonna do it. If this is wrong, I'm not gonna do it. I left my job as ambassador to the US after seven years because I disagreed uh, with our president. And I had that, the luxury of Mr. President, fine, you're my friend, I respect you a lot, but I don't see it the way you're seeing it. And I'm gonna just take a break from the government. I'll just go in and, 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 and to the private sector or somewhere else. So it's, it's, it's good to have these options. Again, the problem in many of the uh, developing countries and, and co post-conflict countries is that people hang on to the government for too long and because they don't see themselves making a living outside government. I think all of you capable young leaders like you should, should serve in the public sector for a while, uh, not forever, because then you're not going to make money and, and you're not going to be that successful. But pay your dues back at least for a while. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, because that's where most of the impact is felt. Uh, we, uh, and I was fortunate to have that mixture of both uh, being uh, trained as an attorney and then being in the private sector, both in Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan, but also to a large extent serving in the uh, public sector, uh, the, the, the Afghan people, and, and also a bigger cause for peace, hopefully. Thank you. Um, so we can move on to audience questions now. If you have a question, please put your hand up and the mic will come to you. Uh, could we go to the member? Thank you. Uh, I'm Adil from Pakistan. I'm very interested in seeing a very durable, peaceful solution in uh, Afghanistan in our next door neighbors. Uh, one of the questions I have is that, if I understand correctly, uh, Afghan government does not currently have a, a a seat on the table in the uh, peace talks. Uh, do you see that as, uh, as an obstacle to a, a lasting uh, peace um, sort of uh, accord? And secondly, if you're sort of privy to this idea, like, uh, w what exactly is the, um, uh, Af uh, the Taliban demands? Uh, have they been evolving over the last six rounds or um, have they been a little bit flexible? Are they open to some kind of uh, reconciliation or are they as rigid as uh, they're sort of known to be? And uh, thirdly, I mean, if I may ask, it, I have lots of questions, but uh, reportedly Afghanistan has like uh, perhaps close to $1 trillion in national resources. Do you, do you see that as, as a potential um, sort of pitch that you can put towards them that if, if we have a peace, we could use these resources towards uh, peace and pro prosperity and progress of our nation instead of uh, just continuing to fight and relying on outside resources? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Habib. That's um, um, very good questions. Uh, on, uh, on the issue of, of uh, Afghan government not being at the table yet, I think, as I mentioned, the three important issues, participation of Taliban in the government, ceasefire, and maintaining and keeping the uh, in, uh, democratic institution, this, the Afghan, there's no uh, substitute for the Afghan government. No one else can do that. If they do it, it's not going to be implemented. So there is need. On the two issue of, of drawdown and guarantees, it is more of a U.S. issue and U.S. have made some progress. And it's good that it's a good start. It, it, it's a good start, um, but the Afghan government should be on the table. And again, part of any peace negotiation is positioning. We used to say to the Taliban, we don't want to talk to you, we talk with Pakistan. Well, there's no need to talk to you. you this is, we will go straight to, to that. And again, it was a positioning, end of the day. They were doing also the fighting. We need to talk to them. And, and so 
And they will also say, no, we don't talk with the Afghan government, we are talking with the Americans. Yes, we talk with the Americans, but about the issues that relates to the Americans. And that makes sense. And we support that, uh, which is, again, is a drawdown in, in other uh, international terrorism. But the, the remaining issues should be an, an issue sorted out between Afghans. But the Afghan government and the Afghan people, that's why there's a need to strengthen the national consensus on the issue of peace. And it's not easy. As I mentioned, give you an example of peace means different things for different parts of Afghanistan. If you're from the south, from the north, from, if you're a woman, if you're an elderly man, if you're a widow, peace means different things for, for each of, of, of those groups. Um, and uh, on the issue of uh, uh, this Afghan participation, uh, on the national uh, resources, yes, we, we see the best way for peace and prosperity in Afghanistan is to, to integrate the region. We, there's, there's a lot of energy in Central Asia and Uzbekistan further up to from Kazakhstan all down that, is, that has a big market in Pakistan and India. There's a lot of products in, in India and Pakistan, cheaper products that could have a very good market in Central Asia. So we have to, we have to open this, this, this commerce and trade. We have to, we prospered, we did well as a country in Afghanistan when we were a crossroad of, of commerce and ideas. We, we start suffering when the Soviets erected a wall as part of Soviet Union and China erected a smaller wall actually. Although China is a, is a big country with a very big wall, but that wall in our border was only 80 kilometers small wall. So, but it, that it stopped the interaction of people in commerce and we suffered. So we, have, we are very much in favor of that. And, and again, the resources that exist in Afghanistan are useful um, if, if, if we resolve our challenges with Pakistan. The way to get this out is through Pakistan or through Iran. Iran has its own challenges now with sanctions and other issues. So it is, it is a regional uh, integrity um, and, and, and mutual dependencies that we have to be dependent on Pakistan. Pakistan has to be dependent on us because we all have an obligation to deliver services to our people. If there is no electricity in Kandahar, it's, it's as bad as not electricity in Karachi. So we, we have to find a way to, to serve these people together. And that's what we are, we are, we are, we are aiming for. But we, we, we have not making progress, to be honest, on, on some of these issues, because some of the leaders, especially military leaders, in our parts of the world, in Pakistan, they don't think economically. They still think politically. We have to learn in, in, in countries like Afghanistan to start thinking economically and get away from thinking too much politically. That's our problem. If we start, like India is doing better than some of other countries in the region because India start thinking economically. Uh, and, but we are, we, are, we are backed down by still being totally focused politically and, and thinking politically instead of seeing that what will serve our best interest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we go to the hand in the first row, please? Hello, Ambassador. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, I was talking to the people there, um, trying to understand the conflict that was there with the Taliban. A lot of them brought up the Durand line, and it's the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And um, I know it's a very complicated issue, but I was wondering if you could talk a little about it and mention any of the solutions that you think might be there, because according to them, that was one of the main issues that was still causing the conflict up until now. Um, so any insight from you would be amazing. That Thank you. Yes, that's, that's an, it's an, uh, an emotional issue, both in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, a, a difficult issue to, to, to talk about, to, to take a, a position about it, um, but uh, because uh, the Durand line divides actually people on both sides of the border that otherwise share a lot of similarities, cultural, linguistic and other heritages, but a lot of the border do the same thing. And again, our border with Uzbekistan also divides people that are, are Uzbeks on the other side and some Uzbeks on this side. So I think, and again, Instead of overemphasizing it politically and, 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 and trying to avoid any serious discussion about it, we have to think about it economically. We have to find ways to enable good Afghans, normal Afghan citizens, and normal Pakistani citizens to cross the line or the border and, and, and prosper by, by, by conducting commerce and trade, like the border between France and Germany, for instance. It's politically, it's a border, but economically, people can cross. So 
I don't think that the solution is to, to build a wall or, or barbed wire and divide people. It doesn't work. We have seen that, 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 that wall and, 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 and division uh, policy. And, and as I can give an example of Soviet Union, we are doing better with, with the Uzbeks because there is more openness between us than it was under the Soviets, that when everything was closed. Uh, so it, I think the solution is to provide more facilities for people, good people, not actually bad elements from both sides, good people. Because when you close it actually to normal commerce and trade, then the bad people, the narco traffickers or the terrorists, they find a way anyhow to, to cross it. You have to facilitate better interaction between the people on both sides to be able to, to cross the border, to conduct commerce, and to prosper actually collectively from, by, by doing more business with each other. There's, there's a significant amount of, of of uh, smuggling going on between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and sometimes our friends in Pakistan complain about that. Because we have like, say, 10% tariffs on, on tires or, or on cigarettes, and Pakistan has like 80%. So it makes sense <laughs> for someone to bring it into Afghanistan and then, then selling it overnight to Pakistan. So the challenge is not, it's not the problem, it's not really the border, or the, the problem is that we have to harmonize our trade policies. We have to probably increase a little bit or our, our, our do, do this, or Pakistan have to decrease there. So you harmonize the trade policies and then you overcome the, the, the challenge of, 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 of smuggling. Because if it is, as long as there's a difference of, you have say 20% cigarette tax and Pakistan has 100%, well, there's, there's room for someone to, to, to make profit. So it's, um, we have to look into that as an economic issue and find ways for the people to prosper collectively. I think we have time for one last question. Um, can we go to the hand in the back, please? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for your talk, Ambassador. Um, uh, I have a question, and it's, uh, you've covered the uh, rights of women, and we all know that they were oppressed under the Taliban. Um, you mentioned that they had an ideology of wiping out the infidel. Um, does the infidel in this case include uh, members of Afghan religious minorities as well as the foreigners. And if that's the case, if there has been ethnic cleansing under the Taliban, do you think it's morally defensible that the US is not only sitting down with them, but also asking their taxpayers to pay for their expenses? For, ah, yeah, the, the, the travel expenses you mean, yeah? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a tough question. Are Taliban, have Taliban changed? They are no longer terrorists? Are they terrorists? Very good questions. Painful questions, tough questions for Afghans. It's one question that you ask it is an academic setting, it's another thing than when Taliban have killed your son. Uh, or Taliban have, 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 have uh, burned actually your vineyards or, 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 or orchard in Afghanistan. It's a tough question. But the peace, the necessity of peace required that you talk to the terrorist. It, it, it's as simple as that. Peace talks is talking to the terrorists. You change the definition because you, you, you don't have any other option. You cannot impose a military solution to that. And, and that's where, 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 the, where, where the, the painfulness of the peace process comes. That's why when I mentioned that you have to keep the consensus among yourself, it's hard. It's, it's not difficult. It's very difficult. And the concern you raise, I, I hear it from many times from Afghan women. It says, don't talk about peace unless you really talk about our rights. And we will protect it. We were proud of it. And, and they're right. And, 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 and they should. And they must. And they should not allow people like me or, or, or our president to, to, to talk on their behalf. They should defend that. These are some very, very tough, very um, decisions that you have to make. But peace is about making compromises. And, 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 and this, these compromises are painful. Uh, peace is, 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 is not, it's a beautiful thing, it's not. The beautiful thing is when you just wipe, wipe them out and, and, and then declare victory. But, but we can't do this. Uh, we, 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 we don't have the means to do that. So you're right, it's again, and the U.S. is, if not only U.S., in the world, um, what, what U.S. in one point considered freedom fighter against U.K., U.K. considered, uh, uh, enlisted them as terrorists. The, 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 the nationalist movement in the U.S. was considered a terrorist <laughs> movement here, and then you change the definition. So you change the definition, but does it change their nature? 
uh, that's where the, the, all the issues of reintegration and justice came about. Yes, uh, the peace will not last if there is no justice. Uh, but you have to have a peace first and then start delivering justice gradually. I will, this la one last question, we'll take one more. Yeah, thank you. Okay, just one last question. Yeah. Um, can we go to the farmer? Uh, the hand in the front row. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the great talk. Uh, I want to go back to domestic politics in Afghanistan. Uh, you said lo there is lots of challenges to the peace process. Do you think that uh, the Afghan political establishment, who are not part of the government now, are posing a greater threat to the peace talks? Because, for example, they boycott the peace jericho, or they, they, um, when it, whatever the government says, they, they go against it. So do you think that the Afghan political establishment, they need to come together and they need to be united in their talks with the Taliban and settle their differences? What, what do you think of that? No, I, 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 I agree with you that the Afghan uh, political establishment, the Afghan elite, needs to be united uh, on, on, on taking a, a, a more unified stand. It could, it could and would not be a fully unified stand because I keep mentioning that 30 million Afghan, 30 different interpretation of the peace uh, because the impact of the war is different on each one. But I hope that they put the national interest of the country, the, the necessity for peace talk ahead of their personal interest. Dealing with the peace process on a tactical basis. Trying to have a peace in Afghanistan because of a deadline of somebody in Afghanistan or outside Afghanistan is not going to be helpful. We have to have a strategic patience on that and then we have to we have to be ready to do, to, to, to do sacrifices to accomplish that instead of trying to, to direct the process in a way that will benefit a particular person or group. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you. They, they will come, they will be better respected, they will, be, they, they will have further respect and, 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 and lasting impact in Afghanistan if they provide actually a unified approach. Uh, they, but they have their rights, they are entitled to have different uh, opinion, different interpretation. That's that we cannot impose upon them, but it has to be the national interest of the country and the ending of the bloodshed is a first priority and then their interest. Thank you. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. But please join me in thanking the ambassador. Thank you. Very much.